Welcome to the Becoming Superhuman Podcast, where we interview extraordinary people to bring you the skills and strategies to overcome the impossible. And now, here's your host, Jonathan Levy. Before we get started, I want to ask you, what would it mean for you to be able to double or even triple your memory and ability to learn? So many people tell us that this skill would be absolutely life-changing for them, but they just don't have the time. They just don't have the time. So that's why we have developed, my team and I, a five-day memory mastery crash course where we go into all the fundamental neuroscience and the actual techniques that are used by the world's best memory athletes and world record holders. It's a course that we value at $97, but here's the thing. We are actually giving this course away completely for free. All you have to do to enroll in the course is visit jle.vi slash five. That's jle.vi slash five. Greetings, super friends, and welcome to this week's episode, which is lovingly crafted thanks to a review from Mia Heat 18364. I guess all the other Mia Heats were taken. In the United States of America, who says, title, very interesting and informative, five stars, awesome show, learn something new every time. Well, thank you, Mia, for that lovely review. And for those of you who haven't left a review, I just realized we only have 173 reviews and all my other buddy podcasters have like 300, 600, 1,000. So you guys are giving me like a review inferiority complex here. I'm mostly kidding, but I'm also kind of not. So please leave us a review on iTunes or Stitcher. They totally cheer up our team and they cheer me up too. On to today's episode. You guys, we are joined by Evan DeMarco. He's a sports medicine and nutrition expert, a published author, a public speaker, and a frequent guest on television, radio, and digital platforms. He's also a successful serial entrepreneur whose interest in diet, health, and supplements began as an athlete and consumer and led him to create a supplement called Alpha Omega. Now, in order to do that, he actually went back to school, studied bio and organic chemistry, and dove deep into everything from prenatal supplements to fat-soluble vitamins. And well, as you guys can imagine, you know me, I geeked out hard on this episode and really, really enjoyed learning all about all these different things. It's not every day that I get to talk to a biochemist or an organic chemist. I get to talk to both today. And so we learn a lot. We learn about some of the supplements that you really might want to consider because of some of the dietary imbalances and deficiencies that we have in our modern diet and lifestyle. We talk about, of course, one of my favorite subjects, which is digital addiction and what it's doing to our brains. And we talk about, well, I'll leave it up to you guys to discover, but I think you're really going to enjoy this episode. I certainly did, even though it's the second one I've recorded today. All right, on with the magic with my new super friend, Evan DeMarco. Mr. Evan DeMarco, welcome, welcome. I'm so glad to finally connect. How are you, my friend? I am great. Uh, Thank you so much for having me. I feel like we've been uh, dancing around getting on this podcast for a while. Yeah, you know, I'm guilty, but when I say guilty, I mean actually proud that I've been recording these like four months in advance. So uh, <laughs> it's been pretty hard and I've had pretty low motivation to record because everyone is like, well, when's it going to come out? And I'm like, four months from now. <laughs> so yeah, I'm glad that it's finally our time. All good things come to those who wait, right? Absolutely. So Evan, tell us a little bit about yourself. I know you have all kinds of different history in and around health. Tell me a little bit about your story and how you got to be where you are. Ah, uh, great question. And and I will try to uh, keep it really short for your listeners. We got time. Half our listeners are in traffic right now, man. So just, you know, whatever makes the drive go. There you go. Okay. So I basically grew up with sports being the real driving force in my life. It was baseball. It was football. It was, I mean, basically anything that I could do to be outside playing. And then high school came around and baseball kind of rose to the top of the, you know, the sports equation for me. So then I went on to play uh, in college and then got hurt and, uh, you know, kind of lost my scholarship and lost my ability to play. And, and so 
health and wellness had always really been the backbone of everything that I had done. It was, you know, being in the gym, it was eating healthy. It was, you know, really trying to optimize my performance as an athlete. And then not being an athlete anymore, I kind of found myself really lost. What do I do? So naturally I became an investment banker, <laughs> which, you know, like as one does. Yeah, exactly. The, the most logical uh, next step. You know, I'm like, okay, well, I should put on a three piece suit and a tie and go sit in an office and do paperwork. And, and I thought that's what I should do. And I recognized very early on that that was not my path. I hated every single minute of it. Financially, it was great, but just emotionally, it was that soul sucking. It was just a challenge to get out of bed every morning. And so as a result of the mortgage meltdown, I found myself with an opportunity to consult for a company that was in the sports and wellness category, especially creating supplements and lifestyle products. And I was doing it from a business perspective, but I fell in love with the product again. I fell in love with the branding and the, you know, the active lifestyle and everything that people were doing to improve their health and wellness journeys. But I wanted to actually formulate, and I recognized early on that I didn't have the background to formulate. So I went back to school and started studying all the biochemistry and organic chemistry and all the things that no one ever really wants to study. Wow. Good for you. <laughs> Thank you. Just so that I had a foundation to really understand what I could do in a lab and how I could actually help improve you know, some of the products that were really in the back of my mind, but didn't have the scientific knowledge to bring to the forefront. And so that was great. I was going to school at night kind of running this company during the day, spending all the time in the lab. I would take my notes from school into the lab and, you know, bring them to the lab guys. And they hated me because I was just asking every stupid question under the sun. I'm like, well, can we do this? Can we do this? And basically, I kind of got a crash course in product development. And so built that company up, sold it, and then started really uh, going deep into product development for a whole bunch of different companies on everything in, in the health and wellness category, everything from chia seeds to protein bars to you know, recovery products too. I mean, and you name it, I, I had my hands in it. And then I started working on prenatal vitamins. And that was kind of one of those things. I got a contract to do it. I was doing it rather dispassionately. It's like, oh, it's prenatal vitamins. I don't really have anything that's uh, in this that's super exciting until I found out I was going to be a dad. Then I'm like, whoa, okay, let's really take a look at prenatal vitamins. Right. Got some skin in the game. Exactly. And what I found was that most prenatal vitamins pretty much suck. <laughs> they, they haven't changed since my mom was taking them, you know, 40 years ago. And so I really wanted to look at fetal brain development, at infant brain development, on how our brains develop and see if I could optimize prenatal vitamin supplementation. So I really went down this road of trying to understand how our brains work and what it is that we're doing to our brains, why incidences of Alzheimer's and dementia become so rampant now. And so really kind of got into the whole brain health category. And that's been a big passion of mine for a long time is really trying to optimize our brain health to recognize that we have done so much to our environment that we have done so much as far as a negative lifestyle that we have to really look at some of these optimization techniques to really ensure that we've got our brains you know staying healthy as long as humanly possible and it's great cuz you know we can keep our bodies healthy but what good is uh you know this incredible body if our brains are gone and conversely you know what's the benefit of having a brilliant mind if you can't get out of bed so it's really become this balancing act of how do we optimize our entire lifestyle. So we've got this mind body connection and things are working well, hopefully well past 100. 100%. And this is super fascinating. I mean, I get to talk to a lot of experts, but very rarely, I get to get as nitty gritty as the bio and organic chemistry level. So I'm going to totally geek out. I'm really looking forward to it. I don't even <laughs> apologize for all the geeky questions. You said something that stood out to me, which is our environment has become kind of so disjointed from our evolutionary footprint. I'm kind of putting words in your mouth, but tell me a little bit more about that. I mean, what are the concerns for our brain health with regards to our environment, our diet, kind of I'll broadly classify it as our modern lifestyle. What are the things that are scary and stand out for you? I think one of the biggest ones that I noticed right out of the gate was the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. You know, I kind of come from an Italian background, you know, where olive oil and fish and, you know, all of these things were kind of dietary staples. Right. And then as you kind of look at, at the modern Western diet, we recognize what we're doing to our bodies as a result of these high omega-6 intakes, you know, things like the saturated fats, the corn oils, all of these things. So when we look at the historical numbers on this one, we go back in time 200 years, we see that the average omega-6 to omega-3 ratio is right around four to one. Mm. And that's great. 
that really seems to be this kind of sweet spot in our evolutionary cycle where, you know, we've got enough omega sixes, we've got enough omega threes, these polyunsaturated fatty acids are working really synergistically in our body. If you look at the average American right now, that ratio has jumped to 20 to one. Wow. So that omega-6 is so hyper pro-inflammatory. I mean, we are literally walking around as inflamed human beings 24-7. And what that does is, you know, I mean, we're seeing it everything, the diabetes, arthritis. I mean, every indication under the sun begins with acute inflammation becoming chronic, which becomes disease. But then we see it in the brains, right? It's really Alzheimer's, dementia, cognitive decline, all of these things are systemic from our diets. Um, and that is one of the biggest culprits right there because that is, I mean, really, if, if we're inflamed and our bodies are not controlling inflammation, we're not resolving inflammation the way that we should, it's going to systemically impact us in all areas, especially in our brains. Right. And that's such an important thing that I, I want to actually emphasize and underscore what you said, which is really all problems. Most people don't realize this. I didn't realize this until years of conducting this podcast, but so many problems in the body are caused by inflammation. And we're not even talking about like uh, toxins. No, we're talking about actually these are known problems. Like anything that ends with an itis means that it's inflammation, right? So arthritis, and well, there's a hundred different itises out there that you can think of, and that all means that it's inflammation, but you're also talking about systemic inflammation, the body holding water and kind of just not being able to process and not being able to flush and not being able to work properly. Yeah. And, and I mean, really that boils down to our diet, right? I mean, you hit the nail on the head. It's if we can't I always look at it like acute inflammation is great, right? We get a cut, our immune system goes to that cut, it tries to resolve that inflammation. So we're going to get some inflammation, we're going to deal with that. But if our bodies are so busy trying to fight off all of this other inflammation because we don't have the proper immune modulation, we don't have the proper omega-6 to omega-3 ratios, we've got environmental toxicity that's wreaking havoc in our bodies, well then our immune system can't handle that cut as effectively as it should. So that acute inflammation can then become chronic inflammation, which then becomes disease. And it's like, you know, we look at it as just a simple cut, but that could mean so much more. And it's funny, I was actually having dinner with a doctor friend last night and she was, you know, pointing to like this thing on her knee. She went hiking and she banged her knee and she's like, I've had this like bruise on my knee for six months. And we started talking about it. It's like, you know, doctors are usually the most unhealthy people out there, right? It's their right. lifestyles and their diets and everything like that. And, and we kind of started peeling back the layers and she's like, yeah, I should probably just go get some blood work and see where my, you know, omega-6 to omega-3 ratios are. And that's just one part of it. But if we isolate that alone and started modulating our, our ratios back to where they should be at that four to one, it's amazing what we could accomplish. Totally. And for people who are wondering, like, where are these omega-6s coming It's mostly grains, right? Like a lot of grains and all these like refined foods are full of omega-6 fatty acids. Correct. Yeah. I mean, that's that's it. And and there are some natural sources of those, you know, like walnuts and other things. And those are great. But yeah, when you start talking about your refined foods, your corns, you know, your corn oils, you know, just go to McDonald's and everything on there is just an omega-6. Right. And fresh fish and olive oil and stuff like that, as you said, those are omega-3 sources. Correct. And here's something interesting. We'll, we'll geek out a little bit more, but if you look at fish oil, right? And this is one of the platforms that I never really understood until I did a deep dive onto it. But fish oil predominantly, or most fish oil predominantly comes from like anchovies and sardines that are caught mm-hmm. off the coast of Peru. And so from there, they're taken to like a fish factory and they're literally just pressed. And you've got like fish oil and fish meal is sent off to places around the world for fertilizer and pet food and things like that. Huh. That fish oil, which is most commonly referred to as 1812 or crude oil, and that 1812 is representative of the EPA and DHA concentration of 18 and 12% for a total of 30%. Well, that remaining 70% is all things like saturated fat, pro-inflammatory omega-6, cholesterol, all of the bad fats, right? So people think, oh, I need to take a fish oil because it's healthy. So they go to Costco and they buy their four-year supply of fish oil for $9 or whatever it is. And that's typically that really cheap fish oil, which has more omega-6 on it. So now they're just exacerbating an already bad situation, right? You've got a 20 to 1 omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. You go buy a cheap fish oil and it's like, well, that's not doing anything for you. Whoa. Okay, guilty because I definitely have like a six-year supply of fish oil in my fridge right now. (laughs) 
<laughs> you know, and I threw out the bottles. I put it all in glass jars, but I don't remember where it came from. But I think it probably came from a GNC or something like that. So here's one way to tell on this one is go take it out of the refrigerator, put it in the freezer overnight. And if you take it out in the morning and it's cloudy, you'll know it has more saturated fat than it has the, you know, the concentrated omega threes. Oh, that's a really nice test. Did everyone in the audience catch that? So you take it out. So in the fridge, it has a little bit of clouding, like little streams of clouding. But you're saying it has to go in the freezer. And if it's completely clouding, then it's junk. Exactly. And I mean, you know, think of it as the coconut oil test, right? I mean, everyone's got coconut oil and you know that at below 72 degrees, it's solid. Above 72 degrees, it's liquid. So you've got that saturated fat that has that solid point. And especially with that combination of saturated fat and polyunsaturated fatty acids with your omegas, put those in the freezer. And if that thing comes out cloudy, you know you've got a higher concentration of the sat fats than you do the omega 3s. And, and that's usually a good indication that you need to increase the concentration level of your omega 3s when you're shopping next time. That is really, really interesting. And just so we're clear, I mean, it's saturated fat. We can say what we want about it. it. It's been vilified, but it's actually not the saturated fat you're worried about. It's the omega sixes in that highly processed, you know, saturated fat. And the more the fact that you're not getting the omega threes that you think you are in your fish oil supplement. Correct. Yeah. And so, you know, if, if you're really looking at the teeter totter, the balancing equation with all of these, you know, saturated fats, polyunsaturated fatty acids, your omega six, your omega threes. If your diet isn't optimized to the point that you have that four to one kind of ratio that we know is the sweet spot, so you're already kind of pro-inflamed with more omega-6s in your diet, and then you take an omega-3 or a fish oil supplement that has more omega-6s, well, you're just adding more weight to the, you know, the omega-6 side of the teeter-totter, and so you're, not, you're not really optimizing or balancing your body the way that you should be. Wow. Really, really interesting. Now, I want to ask you, Evan, because again, I don't often get an opportunity to geek out with an organic chemist. People often say that, you know, we pee out most of our vitamins. What's your take on that? I mean, I know vitamins are different from fish oils and even minerals, but what's your take on which supplements are worth taking and which ones you really do have to get from dietary nutrition? That is probably the best question you could have asked. So I'm happy you asked that. <laughs> It's funny, right? You know, because I think by and large, Americans are laughed at from the rest of the world because we have the most oh, expensive yeah. pee. How many billions do we spend on supplements, right? Right. My take on this is pretty succinct, is that let's go back 50 years, 100 years, right? You know, if you were middle America, you were a farmer, maybe you weren't eating enough citric acid or, you know, enough citrusy fruits or something like that. You know, maybe you take a vitamin C because you're worried about getting scurvy. Well, that ship has sailed, right? So now we get into these multivitamins and we get into a lot of these right. even fat soluble vitamins. So we're constantly taking these things, but we don't know why. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's because our mailman gave us some tip on the latest, greatest supplement. Maybe we saw, you know, a friend who recommended it. Maybe the internet, uh, you know, gave us some recommendation. But my thing is, is unless you're taking a supplement that's directly tied to some diagnostic test that says you need that supplement, oftentimes you're just wasting your money. Or worst case scenario, you might be doing more harm than good. So if you're working with a great practitioner, and I don't necessarily mean your general practitioner, but a good maybe naturopathic doctor or someone who kind of believes in looking at some of the data points, looking at your blood work, looking at where you might be deficient, and then creating a supplement program based off of that, then oftentimes you're just wasting money or worst case scenario, you're doing more harm than good. I think you know, where you can never go wrong is the water solubles, right? Because worst case scenario, you're going to pee them out. Exactly. Vitamin C, you know, I where we really get into trouble and where I really start to see some issues is when we start taking these fat solubles on a consistent daily basis, your vitamin E's, your vitamin D's, your, you know, your fish oils. If you're constantly loading your system up with these fat solubles and you're not processing them, well, any fish oil, whether it's in your body or if it's sitting out on your counter or in your freezer, eventually can go rancid, right? So what's to think that if you've got all of this fish oil just building up in your system and you're not metabolizing it, that it's not going to go rancid? And what does that do to your body on a long enough timeline? My personal thing is, is that I give myself a reset. So I take my supplements and then, you know, once every six weeks, I take two weeks off and I don't take anything. I allow my body to reset and then I jump back in. Really smart. 
But I'm always using diagnostic tools to understand what it is that I should be taking. You know, how do I optimize my body? How do I optimize my cellular function? You know, I, I think I'm in Park City right now. And I'm, as soon as we get done with this, I'm going to get some stem cell therapy. So it's all about, you know, just this balancing act. How do we optimize our bodies? Yeah, I love that. I want to hear more about the stem cell therapy. And I would love to hear about diagnostics because I'm always geeking out on different ways that I can measure. You know, I just did the Viome test. I've done Ubiome, 23andMe. You know, I've got all the testers, all the devices, all the everythings you could ever possibly want for testing. Tell me more about that. So I've done all of those as well. Uh, the Viome, I think, is a good one. I like that in comparison to some of the other ones just because we get to see a little bit more of the RNA piece. Mm -hmm. And you kind of can really look at the truest expression of what that RNA is versus just your DNA snippets. So I like it from a problem solution standpoint, right, is we know that if we can take some of that data, which is still being cultivated, right, this is by no means an exact science, but the process is getting better, the data is getting better. So if we can kind of, you know, optimize our diets off of those and then really look at, you know, I mean, perfect example, I did mine, it said kale was bad for me. Wow. This is the point in our life where we think that kale is good for everything, right? It's we've got an entire generation of people who can make a lifetime of bad decisions and think they can undo those with a kale smoothie. Right. So like kale is one of those vegetables that doesn't work well because of the oxalate component in it. Spinach, much better for me. So those are great ones. I think, you know, anything that you can look at and say, hey, there's just some small bit of information that you can take away from it, whether it's reducing, you know, kale in your diet, whether it's, you know, reducing dairy or anything like that. And then blood work, you know, the proof is in the blood, right? So you're going to have your microbiome and then you're going to have your blood. And if you can look at both of those and really start to put together the pieces of the puzzle, you can kind of craft this whole health and wellness platform for yourself. And then recognize that that's not going to be what you do every single day for the rest of your life. It's something you need to look at every six months. Retake those tests, work with your doctors, relook at that blood work. If you find you're deficient in vitamin D or whatever it is that you're deficient in, take the supplement, optimize your lifestyle, and then six months later, look at it again. Did you improve? If not, why not? If you did, then what else can you look at? So you're constantly uh, making those small corrections. And, and our bodies are not designed to do one thing every day forever. Right. Except move. <laughs> Except move. Exactly. A perfect example. So that's always from a chemistry standpoint is, is we are a chemistry set. It's how do we consistently tweak, make small corrections so that I want to live to be 150. So I, I think that's the best way to do it. Yeah, absolutely. All right, at this point, I want to pause and take a moment to thank our sponsor, Four Sigmatic, who is making it easy for everyday people to unlock the incredible health benefits of mushrooms. I originally learned about Four Sigmatic when I met their founder at a conference in 2015, and I have been pretty much obsessed with their products ever since. Personally, I use their reishi mushroom tea most nights for an all-natural sleep aid. I carry their chaga immunity blend anytime I travel, and I've also pretty much switched out my usual coffee or yerba mate for their unbelievably awesome mushroom coffee, either in ground or in instant form. Now, what I love about the mushroom coffee is that it combines chaga for immune support with lion's mane for intense focus. And because of that, I actually find it to be more effective than most nootropics or stimulants, including Ritalin, despite having only 40 milligrams of caffeine. It's honestly insane. If you haven't tried out their products, I strongly, strongly recommend you do so. And to encourage you to give them a try, we've actually teamed up with Four Sigmatic to bring you an incredible 15 percent discount. To take advantage of that, just visit foursigmatic.com slash superhuman today. All right, back to the show. I was hanging out with one of the kind of key executives that works with Ray Kurzweil. And we were talking about, you know, just Ray's dream of living to 150 and then eventually living forever. And I just think it's a really interesting challenge. Tell me about the stem cell situation. So speaking of living to 150, the stem cells are, are basically right now kind of an infancy type of technology that's allowing, you know, allowing us to inject stem cells into our bodies and really trying to optimize mitochondrial function and cellular rejuvenation. Uh, and they've been used for a while for different indications, right? So athletes have used them for knee problems, for joint problems. You know, we've got people, Kim Kardashian's using them for her vampire facial type of thing. 
You've got uh, hair transplant guys who are using, you know, the PRP type of thing to improve hair follicle transplants. What we're really starting to understand is the whole chemistry behind this and how the uh, exosomes play a, a role in this, how the stem cells play a role in this, and how each small piece, when you pair it with something else or when you pair it with part of something, a much larger treatment platform, can really optimize mitochondrial function, cellular rejuvenation. So right now, what we're looking at is stem cells, PRP, ozone, laser light therapy, and exosomes as this kind of you know, full body treatment to really wind back the clock a little bit, you know, kind of getting our cells operating on a level that they were a long time ago versus, you know, really looking at what environmental toxicity has done, how our environments are really slowing down our cellular rejuvenation, how it's really slowing down our healing processes. So that's what I'm doing today. And, and it's something I've done a couple of times, but um, this is a new one because we're starting to look at the exosomes and, and the, the Adelson Clinic in Park City is really a cool place that on the forefront of doing some of this really unique, innovative work in, in stem cells and exosomes. Awesome. Really, really awesome. And I don't know if you want to share this, where are you having worked on? I'm going whole body. So, you know, IV whether it's life, stress, genetics, whatnot, I've, I've taken a little bit more hair than I would have liked. So there's a vanity component. I'm injecting some stuff in my hair. Interestingly enough, they have something called the P-Shot. And I actually really like this one. So the P-Shot is stem cells, uh, PRP, ozone, and laser light therapy into the penis for sexual health. Now, one of the things that I really like about this is when you look at the whole human body and how it works – erectile dysfunction can actually be kind of the canary in the coal mine, right? You know, when you look at, at just the, you know, the physiological makeup of our sex organs, we can start to see, you know, atherosclerosis, any type of cardiovascular disease uh, originate there before we see it in the rest of our body. So this is one of those things where it's just kind of general health and wellness, just maintenance, you know, things that, you know, really allow us to kind of stave off the, the hands of time. So yeah, it's kind of a, what shall we say, the 60,000 mile tune-up <laughs> in the stem cell category. Awesome. Really, really cool. Now I have to ask, first off, I guess a couple different categories of this question. First one, what are the other supplements that you take on a daily basis besides the fish oil? And I guess also before you answer that, I know that the supplement that you work on, the alpha omega has another ingredient, hence the name alpha and omega. Tell me about that ingredient. Tell me about other supplements that you're taking, and then we'll get into the, the follow-on questions. Okay. All, so what else I take, and again, I usually cycle off of things. So I'm always big on brain health. I love 5-HTP. Um, I love ginkgo. I mean, really keeping yeah. blood flow uh, to the brain uh, you know, going is, you know, you just can't ask for something better, right? It's like, let's just keep the blood going where it's supposed to be going. All natural, safe. Yeah, it's a great, yeah. great option. L-theanine is another one of my favorites. Um, and I think, you know, as, as amped up as we are in this society, as stressed out as we are, you know, anything that can kind of help modulate that stress is, is a good thing. I really am big on glutathione, but it has to be liposomal. I'm really big on, you know, one of my favorite ones is milk thistle. On rare occasions, if I'm entertaining clients or if I'm out and I have too many glasses of wine, that really helps the next day as far as alleviating a hangover. You know, those are the ones that I kind of consistently take outside of the alpha and omega. And we'll talk about that. So when I was developing prenatal vitamins, one of the things that I looked at was brain development in the first couple of years of life. And our brains really develop the most during the breastfeeding time. Now, we can kind of see a lot of brain development from ages one to five and that really exponential growth. But all of that really concrete brain development, a lot of the things that happen you know, from balancing and walking and just understanding our environments and beginning of language skills all happen in that real first year of life most of the time when people are breastfeeding. So I started looking at breast milk is what's in it? What are the constituent parts of that? And why is that maybe a catalyst to some of this exponential brain growth? Two of the biggest things in there are omegas, predominantly DHA and choline. And choline is one of those things that's become more and more a topic of conversation in brain health. But what I found was you have choline salts like choline bitartrate, choline citrate, 
And what I found is those have really no impact on brain metabolism whatsoever. So then you have to start going down the road of like the phospholipids. And you've got phosphatidylcholine and all of these. But when we a European Food Safety Agency report came out and what it started studying was breast milk. And they found that the predominant choline source in breast milk was something called alpha glycerol phosphocholine, which is basically a water phase phospholipid. So it's a phospholipid with the fatty acid tails that have been removed and replaced with a glycerol backbone. So now you have something that easily crosses the blood-brain barrier. Mm. So when that binds with DHA, you kind of have this really unique matrix. It's where the whole is definitely greater than the sum of the parts. So you're talking about improved cell-to-cell communication, nerve conduction velocity, increased growth hormone, uh, lower C-reactive protein, you know, really starting to develop, you know, just those communications in the brain, that cellular network. And these two ingredients were really the cornerstone of that. So I started giving it to my wife as this kind of prenatal matrix. And then she was kind of giving some of her friends and some of her friends were saying, well, I feel a whole lot sharper when I take this. Then I kind of started looking at like, well, what happens as we get older? And, and turns out, especially in our supplement world, once we get to a certain age, especially as adults, we switch from DHA to EPA. And that's been kind of the, the model that has been pitched to us for so long as EPA is really the anti-inflammatory omega-3. So we stop really focusing on this DHA, on this brain health until we get further down the food chain or further down the uh, our life cycle. And then like, oh, maybe we should start adding DHA back in. So I really wanted to create this product that allowed us to, you know, as adults take in GPC, glycerol, fossil, choline, and DHA to optimize brain health. So what started out as this prenatal vitamin kind of evolved into this, this daily supplement regimen that I created and, you know, started selling and, and developing and, you know, really as this just completely natural, fundamental base for brain health. And I always kind of got a little nervous with some of the other stuff out there with, you know, whether it's like lion's mane or jellyfish extract or some of this other stuff that really has no science and no longevity behind it. Like DHA and GPC have been in the market for 30, 40, 50 years as something that's been studied. So we know what it does. And we know that there really are no side effects to these two constituent parts of this alpha and omega platform I created. Mm. Interesting. Okay. Follow on question. What are the other things that you're doing for brain health? I know exercise is probably one of them, but what exercise, what diet, what are your other habits and kind of hacks for brain health since you think so deeply about it? So I'm competing in a Spartan beast in Tahoe in two weeks. Wow. Yeah. And I don't know how I got myself involved in this one, but you know, brain-derived neurotropic factor is, is obviously a big one. And, and one of the best ways to stimulate that is exercise. I'm a big believer you know, in resistance training. I think that you know, when we really look at long-term running cardiovascular work, I think that that does have a negative impact on our muscular skeletal system. So I think that any longevity platform for our brains, for our bodies has to involve resistance training. And at a pretty comprehensive you know, pace, it's like we need to be doing that four to five days a week. That's a big one for me. One of the things that I found, the greatest thing for our brains is to make sure that the last thing that we do before we go to bed and the first thing that we do when we wake up is not look at our cell phones. Totally. Yeah. And it's just amazing how many people do that. It's, oh, I, I'm going to bed. It's like, check Facebook, check Instagram, you know, check my emails. Like the blue light alone is horrible, but then you start to look at things like FOMO, right? Now a clinical diagnosis. People are actually being diagnosed with FOMO, uh, fear of missing out. Seriously, Wow. What a world. <laughs> exactly. So carving out the emotional time, the spiritual time for ourselves to fall into a natural state of sleep, to stay asleep, to really optimize our sleep uh, patterns without interrupting that with blue light, with anxiety, you know, dry or anxiety ridden social media emails, and then making sure we're doing that in the morning, right? Give yourself that routine first thing in the morning. I wake up, I drink my coffee, I read the news, you know, I work out, you know, I journal, I meditate. It's like, I have that routine in the morning. And I find that if I break that routine, my day is shot. I just can't recover. You know, if, if I check my right. phone and I see the emails, then I spend the rest of my morning solving problems instead of dealing with the thing that's most important, which is my mental and physical health. And if I start off my day appropriately that way, the rest of the day is great. It doesn't matter what problems I can deal with those. But if you don't give yourself that appropriate time to get into your routine every single day, it's going to cost you. Right. Yeah. That's something that I've outlined for one of my goals over the next 
quarter is really nail down what my ideal morning routine is. Now that, you know, my fiance is no longer working outside the house, we're together mornings. And so figuring out what the couple morning routine looks like. And I've just identified that that's going to be one of my biggest low hanging fruit for optimizing and consistently having really, really great days. I mean, I'm pretty good in the morning about not checking my phone, but like getting the exact timing of things, I think is also going to be really important. So having not just a routine, but having the routine start at the same time every single day, even if I don't have a reason to wake up that early. Yeah, it's one of my main focuses and goals. I think it's a great one. And I think if you do nothing else, I think if you did nothing else in this world, but stop looking at your phone first thing in the morning, mentally prepared for your day, you know, whether that's meditating or journaling or whatever else you need, you know, creating that 30 minutes of consistency every single day, that would change most people's lives exponentially. Yeah. No, I absolutely agree. And first off, today we're recording this September 17th. iOS 12 is coming out. So for anyone who hasn't upgraded yet, upgrade because it will actually help you deal with cell phone addiction. It's got all kinds of really amazing features to help you curb cell phone addiction, limit your use. I think it's just an incredible, I've been telling everyone I can about it. I think it's an incredible effort by Apple to realize like the products, not just the products that they build, but the products that are built to operate on the product that they build are becoming a serious addiction factor for people. So install that, pay attention to how much you use your phone, set limits and restrictions. And I got another amazing thing, which I'd love to share with you if you're interested in brain health. First off, the sentence that I want to say was make sure that everyone out there read Cal Newport's book, Deep Work, because it goes into the changes, actual neurochemical and structural changes to the brain that are caused by cell phone addiction. But after reading that, I got a great solution, which is I bought this kitchen safe with a timer on it and uh, you put the phone or chocolate or whatever TV remote in the box. You scroll it to six hours, 36 hours, 96 hours, whatever it is. For me, it's usually, okay, end of the work day. Don't need my cell phone during the work day. Scroll it, eight hours, push the button, it locks. Bye-bye cell phone. Amazing. That's brilliant. Yeah, I can't tell you how much more productive my fiance and I have been because I've been working from home the last few days with her. We just put the phones in the box. And then it's like when we take a break, the break doesn't become a 30 minute check my email on my phone break. It becomes a get up, drink a glass of water. Okay, I don't have anything to do. Get back to work. There was something I read a long time ago, and it was kind of a like a conversational study. And basically within any group context, about every seven minutes, there's a lull in conversation. You know, and and that's just for the conversation to reset itself, a new topic to kind of permeate and go on from there. And it's interesting, right? Go out to dinner with a group of people and find, you know, just check your timer, right? Look at the watch, 8 o'clock, and then about 8.07, you're going to start to see that happen. But what happens is rather than people drinking a glass of water or, you know, starting to eat their food or whatnot, everyone checks their phone. So it becomes that weird thing, right? It's like now it's socially acceptable to be in a group of people and check your phone. And it's horrible, right? What is this doing to our interpersonal communication skills, our interpersonal relationships, right? We're no longer engaged with people. We're so distracted that we're not capable of having these great in-depth fundamental conversations about what people want to do, you know, what their goals, aspirations are, you know, we're losing our ability to communicate and replacing it with our ability to send emojis as a means of, you know, communication. It's horrible. 100%. And the thing is, people don't realize like, this need to always be stimulated. Number one, it causes depression, it causes anxiety, it causes a degradation of your ability to focus on anything. But I was sitting in the room at Genius Network and Alan Parker gave this amazing 10 minute talk about creativity and how you can rediscover your creativity and do your best work when it comes to writing or whatever it is. And it was the most genius revelation. It was one of my biggest takeaways from the week, which is relearn how to be bored. If you're ever not motivated to be productive or creative, it's probably because you have an outlet for your mind, which is turning on Netflix or checking your phone. Put all that crap away, sit in a quiet room for 20 to 30 minutes. He recommended an hour, but most people won't even make it 20 to 30 minutes. You will get so bored, your brain will just do the work, right? You'll have incredible ideas, you'll have incredible motivation, and you will sit down and you will do the best work of your life because most of us don't remember what it's like to be bored since mobile internet came out, you know? Yeah. Does anyone remember what silence was like? 
Right. Or wondering <laughs> like, about someone else instead of sending them a message. I wonder what that person's doing. You know? No, like we just instantly send a message and disrupt someone else's consciousness. You know, it's funny. I have a good friend whose mother unfortunately passed away and um, his mother had a huge, vast collection of books. And so he said, you know, hey, feel free to come over to the house and take any of the books you want. And I'm a big reader. I, you know, I read probably five to six books a week. So I go over there and it was the original like lifetime encyclopedia series. And I'm like, I have to have that. And I recognize one of the things, right, is Google has put all this information at our fingertips, but an encyclopedia was one of those things you have to open and scroll through, you know, page through it and recognize, like, there's this incredible breadth of information. Now, interestingly enough, when you start looking at it, a lot of this information is outdated, but it was still fascinating to have, like, you know, pull out this book and just start scroll, you know, flipping through it be like, see, I can't even say it. I say scroll. And it's like, right. You know, we're conditioned to think that way, but it's flipping through these pages and realizing that we as human beings used to have this inherent curiosity for things and we could go to resources for that. And now with all of this information at our fingertips, it's kind of, I think, taken us mentally backwards in a ways where we don't have that creativity. We don't have that thirst for knowledge. We just recognize that that knowledge is there and so almost take it for granted. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So Evan, First off, amazing that you read five to six books a week. That's mind-blowing. What are some of your top books of all time? You know, I think The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People has to rank as number one. Mm -hmm. And that's just one of those, I can still go back to it, even though it was written a long time ago. And, and obviously, it's been updated. I can still go back to it. And those principles really apply. And it's not just a book that you read from front to back. It's one that stays with you. And you can always just, you know, find one reference point in there. So, you know, if you're having a bad day, it's you just open it up like, ah, you know, let's let's begin with the end in mind. Let's, you know, let's work on some of these personal victories. Mm -hmm. So uh, let me quantify this. And it's funny because I did get into this conversation with someone recently is, is I now use read to also recognize that these are audio books because I when I work out, I listen to books instead of music. So my role or my philosophy is I always balance one fiction with one nonfiction. And I think that just kind of keeps things creative and keeps things flowing. Recently, I read the Red Rising series, which was absolutely incredible as a series of books. It was just this kind of Spartacus meets science fiction meets yeah, the whole thing was just incredible. Anytime that there's a brain book, I mean, like I love Joe Maroon's work. Any time that there's any information that comes out about the brain, I'm soaking that up. So uh, again, I probably read two brain books a week just to really understand what research is being done, where people are going with brain health, what the understandings are coming out with. But yeah, that's the thing is just read as much as you can. And, and that's one of the biggest things to keeping your brain healthy is reading. I love it. I love it. Evan, I want to be respectful of your time. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap us up. But before I let you go and thank you, I just want to ask you, what is your top takeaway from the episode? What's the thing that you hope that people carry with them for the rest of their lives? In theory, we've only got one spin on this third rock from the sun. So don't waste any amount of that time on things like Instagram or Facebook. Or, you know, it's like create your bucket list. Make sure you go out and experience all of the beauty that this planet has to offer. And that's relationships. That's adventure. That's, you know, write down the top 10 things that you want to do at this very moment and go out and do them. But don't just be content with that. Once you do one of them, cross that off and add two things to the bottom. You know, make your life about the experience, about the journey and not just the, you know, I'm binge watching Netflix or, you know, taking selfies somewhere. I think that we've forgotten how to be interpersonal with other people to experience all the joy and potential that this planet has to offer. So I think that's the basis of any health and wellness journey is know where you want to go, know what you want to accomplish, and then backfill everything with solid data. Work with a good diagnostic physician, look at your labs, eat healthy, uh, you know, just understand your body and understand what you want to do with it. And I think the rest will follow. I love that. And if people want to reach out and learn a little bit more, tell us a little bit about the Alpha Omega supplement that you created and where people can find it. So I would go to omaxhealth.com. Uh, that's O-M-A-X health.com. There's a whole uh, series of blog posts. There's the book, uh, 30 Days to a Better Brain that I wrote on there that you can take. And that's just simple tricks and hacks to really kind of optimize brain health in a 30-day period. And you can find me on uh, Instagram, again, as we bash uh, social media. You can find me there, uh, Evan underscore DeMarco, or uh, on Facebook at Evan DeMarco. Awesome. Make sure to check that out. I'm going to check this out because well, first I'm going to do my test. 
on my fish oil that is in my fridge and see what I'm working with because maybe I lucked out and got the good stuff. But for my refill, I want to check out this Omax Alpha Omega product. And just uh, one other question for people asking, because it is, I know it's like meant to boost cognitive health. Is it also going to stimulate you or is it something you can take at night? It's a morning thing. Explain to me how that one works. So Alpha GPC does not have any cardiovascular stimulant. Now, some people will find that just because of the neurocognitive benefit that they do stay awake, but they're finding that it's like, oh, I'm staying awake, but I'm thinking about things, not ruminating on problems, but they become hyper creative. My recommendation is always start in the morning that way if you do have any issues. I mean, it is a water phase phospholipid, so it'll burn out of your system usually by the time you go to bed, but start in the morning. And then, yeah, it's, I mean, you'll definitely find that just being laser focused, being more in tune with your brain and, and able to kind of be less ADD, it's amazing what you can accomplish. Awesome. And if I'm not mistaken, you guys also have a product that is just the ultra pure fish oil if people don't want the kind of alpha GPC thing. Correct. Yeah. So if you're looking for just a good, incredible quality fish oil, something that's a 93% concentrate, that's one of the best in the market. Uh, one that uh, Omax is very, very proud of. Love it. Love it. Awesome. Check that out, folks. Omaxhealth.com. And we will also link that in the podcast episode at superhuman.blog. Evan DeMarco, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting and getting to know you, my friend. I hope we really keep in touch. Absolutely, Jonathan. Thank you so much. This was an awesome interview. Awesome. My pleasure. See you soon. Take care. All right, super friends, that is all we have for you today, but I hope you guys really enjoyed the show and I hope you learned a ton of actionable information, tips, advice that will help you go out there and overcome the impossible. If you've enjoyed the show, please take a moment to leave us a review on iTunes or Stitcher or drop us a quick little note on the Twitter machine, at Go Superhuman. Also, if you have any ideas for anyone out there who you would love to see on the show, we always love to hear your recommendations. You can submit on our website or you can just drop us an email and let us know. That's all for today, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for tuning in to the Becoming Superhuman podcast. For more great skills and strategies or for links to any of the resources mentioned in this episode, visit www.becomingasuperhuman.com slash podcast. We'll see you next time.